First of all, I always like to have a conversation. These are complicated issues that we deal with at Wemiak and in the community, particularly around climate. So if at any point in the discussion you have a question, you have a comment, you want to dig a little deeper on a topic, please, um, please feel free to jump in. Second, I'd like to hear from you about and get a sense of where you are on climate issues. What are you concerned about? Um, how, how are you facing this issue in your, in your own lives? What are your questions? What are you curious about? Um, I'll, I'll take some of that information and as I move through um, my presentation, I, I will try and connect those pieces and threads and weave them together a little bit. So, so tell me what you're thinking about climate. Julia. <laughs> Right. Uh-huh. I saw another. Um, how to leverage technology. Yeah, great question. A couple others. Yeah. Yeah. The development of the third world, and, and, and that's an interesting topic I'll touch on. In the back? Too late. Is it too late? <laughs> <laughs> and one more in the back. Sure. So the polar vortex. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I always try and be as relevant as possible um, because we 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 do only have. Um, I don't want to say we only have a little bit of time, <laughs> but we've we we've got to get our boots walking in the same direction on these topics and. Uh, the faster we move, the more likely my children, who are five and four, are going to be able to enjoy the Great Lakes in the same way I have throughout my childhood. Um, the more likely they will have a balanced lifestyle and a quality of life that, um, that, that doesn't burden them. Um, so these are the things that, that um, motivate people, and, and that's my, my primary job. I want to tell you a, a little bit about Wemiak. I love this picture of Wemiak activists smoking in the forest in 1970. <laughs> um, it always makes everyone laugh, but, um, but Wemiak has a long history. We were founded in 1968 uh, by a woman named Joan Wolfe, who was a member of the Audubon Society. And she came into awareness, along with many other citizens of the community, um, of what, what really formed the modern environmental movement um, in West Michigan and in the United States. And that was concerns, growing concerns about uh, the chemical industry and the pervasive use of chemicals in society. So you'll recall that in uh, the 40s, in the 30s, we had some, in, in 20s, we had some significant wars. Out of those wars evolved chemical technology. Those, um, those individuals 
um, men who were working f in the uh, the war industry came uh, came home from war and began to integrate uh, chemicals into our everyday lives. And much like the the internet is the new economy for you know the 21st century, chemicals were kind of like this innovation, this technology, and and drove a new economy in, at the turn in the middle of the 20th century. So we started to see chemicals introduced into food systems, right? Um, we learned how to make things like Hot Pockets. <laughs> um, we, uh, we also saw the pervasive use of chemicals in agriculture and in our communities here in Michigan at the time in the late 60s uh, Dutch elm disease was a major issue trees were dying in neighborhoods and what were municipalities doing to fight Dutch elm disease does anybody know say again well there was some cutting down uh, before that they were spraying DDT in neighborhoods everybody know what DDT is really really toxic chemical there are pictures um, from East Lansing uh, and, and scientists at Michigan State University of uh, trucks literally going down residential streets spraying DDT and kids in bathing suits running behind it like Wah! it's the sprinkler this is the coolest thing <laughs> and, and then of course the next uh, in, over the, the course of days in these neighborhoods, uh, the birds would die. They would be found on the ground. It was, um, it, it, this particular moment was the spring of uh, 1967, I believe. Scientists at MSU started to collect these birds and, and started to, um, to really inform and, and deliver the science and the work that Rachel Carson had laid out in her 1964 book, A Silent Spring. So Rachel Carson um, being, you know, many call her the mother of, uh, of the modern environmental movement. So citizens in Grand Rapids were inspired by this work, they were compelled, and they founded one of the first environmental action organizations uh, on the planet. That uh, led to um, successfully filing suit to ban the use of DDT in the United States, a case that went to the Supreme Court. The citizens who founded WEMIAC established the Michigan Environmental Protection Act, which was the first of its kind. It then um, led to the National Environmental Protection Act and similar acts in states across the United States. It, it, the, we, um, we established uh, the Michigan Lakes and Streams Act and uh, worked on the Clean Water Act and uh, WEMIAC was also this great incubator for environmental law. Joe Sachs was teaching law at University of Michigan and beginning to explore environmental law and the idea of the commons. The idea of the commons is that things like water and air and um, public lands belong to all of us, not just one of us, and so we must be able as citizens of a place um, to be able to defend the commons, right? So, um, so these young lawyers who are just retiring now, um, attorneys like Peter Steckety and Herb Ranta and others, if any of you know them, um, uh, Bob Eleveld and uh, Mark Van Putten, they were practicing and experimenting with environmental law in Michigan and trying cases and seeing how the Clean Air Act would be defended, how the Clean Water Act would be defended throughout the 70s. And um, it's a really, really fascinating time and moment. Today our work is focused on leading environmental protection in West Michigan by inspiring action. And of course, inherent in that is you, um, we, we really help to facilitate citizens and community members identifying the issues that they care about most and then bringing communities together to make change happen. We do that around protecting water and around building resilient communities and we are designed to be on the front line to take new issues and articulate them uh, for broader audiences and then to mobilize people uh, 
in the places that they are at to make change in their personal lives as well as their communities and society as a whole. And so today's challenge is, of course, climate change. It's a pervasive one that cuts across all parts of society. And where are we? Um, the folks at 350.org really define this pretty well. They've identified that we need to be um, a, a healthy planet, can have up to 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Um, we are at 400 parts per million. We have exceeded the goal. <laughs> um, and we are adding two parts per million of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere every year at this point. So unless we are able to redesign our lives, redesign our communities, and rapidly turn that around, and when we say rapidly, we're talking about um, over the next 20 years. Some people say less, and some emerging science is indicating that we might have overshot the goal, <laughs> and we need to be even more aggressive than this. Um, but um, but if we don't if we don't turn these indicators around, we risk triggering tipping points and ir irreversible impacts that um, that will change our lives extraordinarily and um, and create outcomes that we can't predict. So that's pretty depressing. <laughs> In an equally depressing book, <laughs> um, Naomi Klein, This Changes Everything. Has anybody read this yet? Okay, so this is, this is the new hot book in the, the climate change um, movement. And um, Naomi is a, a, a woman uh, of, of, of spirit who I appreciate. She, like me, doesn't like to put any icing on the cake. <laughs> Um, she's, she's pretty real. And she points out that capitalism is failing our climate, no surprise. That ca the idea of constant growth and continually growing our economic footprint and our economic presence is not sustainable and it isn't working. She points out that the big environmental, um, big environmental organizations, the, the, the big folks, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club, etc., they have been lying down with lions, and when lions and lambs lay down with each other, who's going to get eaten? So she, she brings up the criticism of the, the major environmental movement itself, and um, she also cuts at the throat of all of these global meetings we keep happening, having that are, um, are, you know, she's asking the question, are they effective? Are we getting anywhere? Or um, as a result of, you know, failing to, to really hold um, accountability in uh, the space of climate and climate responsibility for countries across the world, we are um, committing ourselves to failure and committing ourselves to climate doom. So, um, so she paints a, a pretty depressing picture. Um, she does, like all good environmentalists and activists, she turns it around in the end and gives you some hope. <laughs> but, um, but this is real. Uh, this week we had a wonderful woman join us. Uh, her name is Nikki Silvestri and she's an activist from Oakland, California. She's been in the green movement for um, about 10 years and most recently she worked for an organization uh, called Green for All, which works on green and blue jobs um, in Oakland, California, and environmental justice. And before that, she was at the People's Grocery. She was really driven into the climate movement through food and her family's history with food. And, um, and you know, what we know about climate is that it disproportionately impacts marginalized communities, people of color, and low-income persons. And so it becomes very important that we look at um, environmental justice and that we begin to mobilize all people in the environmental movement. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history about the environmental movement. Oh, I lost my slide as a whole. And I'm also going to talk about um, environmental justice. And, um, and how the conservation and environmental movement itself 
needs to be held accountable to um, to these issues. So I'll come back to the climate resiliency report. Um, the environmental movement in the United States uh, starts at the turn of the 20th century. And I have this picture because um, I wanted to kind of display and bring some threads in about how creatives have informed and shaped the environmental movement. So um, this is a piece, uh, the Hudson River Valley artists. Does anybody, anybody remember their art history classes, right? So in New York, these, this group of, of really brilliant um, painters were capturing these very dramatic and beautiful um, images and compelling images of the Hudson River Valley. And um, that brought on an awakening of you know, the beauty of place. And with a growing population at the turn of the century and industrialization, people started to become aware that we needed to protect places. And so the beginning of the environmental movement is rooted in conservation. Last year at the Environmental Funders Network, the, um, the network uh, shared an award with uh, the Rockefellers for all of their amazing work on protecting places. And in a very awkward moment, <laughs> in the environmental community, the Native Americans in the back of the room stood up and they recalled to us that these places that we have protected were first their places and that they had been taken from them. And so we have the first piece of an environmental justice issue um, uh, and, and, and we are enlightened in this space that the environmental movement started out by taking things from people. <laughs> um, it's interesting that when we look at our national parks today, we have um, issues around lands laying fallow because they have not been used by the native people in the way that their communities synchronicitously used lands um, in order to inform their growth and their protection and, um, and to, to keep those ecological systems uh, working. And so we have soil erosion in our native parks because we haven't um, burned our prairies and we haven't um, trampled our seeds and our soil is deteriorating in our national parks. And that's because those places haven't been used and for a hundred years they have not been part of the, the, the really um, intricate ecology of people in place and the history of people in place. And no big surprise when you think of it through the lens of that moment at the Environmental Funders Network, right? <laughs> then um, we move in to the modern environmental movement. Um, Rachel Carson is pictured here. I mentioned her, a Silent Spring. Has anybody read A Silent Spring? Couple heads nodding, and great to great to see that. Um, Rachel Carson was a poet first. Her bachelor's degree uh, was in English, and it was it was through writing that she discovered the natural world and its um, its beauty, and again the, the intricate webs of ecology that are so fascinating. And that compelled her to go back and get a master's degree in biology, and then she became one of the first women in the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so how did the environmental movement, the modern environmental movement, fail all people? Well, you know that the modern environmental movement is about pervasive pollutants, and it's about chemicals in our environment. And you also know that, um, that people in cities are disproportionately impacted by pollutants and particularly people of color. So at the same time that we began to build awareness around this, people with power and wealth were creating nimbyism. The, the attitude that, you know, that um, incinerator, we need that incinerator. We have all this technology and all this wealth to build this incinerator, but it's not gonna go in my backyard. It's gonna go over there in their backyard. And so the environmental movement created a dynamic that, um, that, that then put 
communities without as much power in harm's way. And they found themselves surrounded by uh, industrial waste and uh, landfills and incinerators and, um, and, and as uh, people of, of wealth and people with power defined that you know they, they knew they didn't want their kids growing up around this, um, they pushed they pushed that stuff out into other communities. And so we have the second environmental justice issue um, emerging as it relates to the environment. And today, I bring all of this up because today we are moving into the climate um, space. And I, I point out, um, you know, the, the Herman Miller chair there <laughs> and the great work of um, the, the furniture industry here in, uh, in Greater Grand Rapids to deliver sustainable business practices and cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. This is really, really important work and it is the work of creatives in the new economy, the clean green economy, um, in the climate economy. Um, when, when we uh, started doing our climate resiliency report, go back to that, in 2012, we were asked by Mayor Hartwell to start to look at climate resiliency and its impacts in Grand Rapids. We, um, particularly on um, municipal practices. So we got a little award, ironically, it was from Walmart. <laughs> it was the only check I've taken from Walmart. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and we talked to 45 local experts who were, were rooted in climate science and uh, in working in various fields related to climate. We worked with GVSU's Environmental Studies Program and a professor of geography and planning to gather and model lo localized climate data with temperature and precipitation. Elena, Dr. Elena, the boost of Maveva, the Le, uh, <laughs> Elena. <laughs> she's brilliant. She's at GBSU. Did that work? Um, and and so we identified that uh, our community will see a four degree temperature rise. We identified the impacts of that. And um, what are climate impacts in the Midwest in the Great Lakes region? In Increased volatility and the number of extreme heat events um, is one impact. We will see the distribution and intensity of precipitation events um, producing more than two and a half inches of rain at a time. So we've seen these big intense rainstorms, we've seen these big intense snowstorms. Um, a decreased total precipitation in summer and potential increases in winter, increased seasonal volatil volatility. Um, that makes me recall the spring of 2012 when our crops started in March and then we had freezes in April and the entire apple and cherry crops were lost up and down the fruit belt. And um, we put together a series, well, we defined climate change and we put together a series of recommendations. So the report defines climate resiliency as the ability of a community to simultaneously balance ecological, economic, and social systems to maintain or increase quality of life in an uncertain and dynamic future. And our recommendations to the city, I'll just highlight a few of them. You can, um, I have a little card with the website so you can download the report if you're interested in reading more. But Grand Rapids needs a climate resiliency champion, a group of individuals um, working in organization to focus the community on the implementation of best climate practices. We need to support policy proposals to increase energy efficiency and clean energy at the state level, county level, local level. We need to explore legal policy and economic frameworks that enable the city of Grand Rapids to build an autonomous energy system. We have to study and implement new methods of street maintenance and construction, and thus MIMIAC advocated for vital streets when we did our last tax extension. Vital streets are clean, 
green and complete streets. We need to change the transportation culture. So I'm thrilled to be here at the Rapid and my friend Brittany is in the back of the room hooking it up, changing the culture. Thank you. <laughs> um, we need to capture the first flush of precipitation. This is storm water. The, if we can capture the first inch of storm water in our communities in place where it falls and enter that water in, back into nature rather than into uh, infrastructure, we will be more resilient. We need um, to pursue water efficiency efforts because here in the Great Lakes, we have of course taken for granted our access to fresh water, but even here we're experiencing droughts. Isn't that shocking? In Ottawa County, as a result of overuse of water, their groundwater system has dropped a thousand feet. Farmers are pulling up brackish water and it's a result of poor agricultural practices and overuse of the groundwater system. Pretty scary in a community that takes our access to fresh water, 20% of the world's fresh water surrounds us and we're still dealing with drought. We need to improve the quality of the Grand River and its tributaries, restoring them to more, a more natural state. And we need to adopt a strong urban tree canopy goal. So these are some of the, the key aspects of moving the city of Grand Rapids forward. And for that matter, moving the, all cities forward. Um, Mayor Hartwell has been part of President Obama's Climate Resiliency Task Force. and. We have been thrilled to discover that our report is one of the most comprehensive in the country, looking at 22 different municipal functions. Um, so we, we're in a good place here. We're thinking ahead, but Grand Rapids is not an island. Grand Rapids is surrounded by a myriad of communities. We're in a watershed that is 3,300 uh, square miles. It has uh, 18 different municipalities in it and local governments. So um, Grand Rapids itself can do all that it can, but if we aren't dealing with climate resiliency in the city of Wyoming, in the city of Kentwood, the city of East Grand Rapids and beyond, then we're failing ourselves. And that's a place where we can become civically engaged in really raising a groundswell to move the entire region forward and not, not just thinking about the city of Grand Rapids itself. Um, the other most important thing that we discovered ab about um, climate resiliency is that we, the, because the environmental movement has um, in, in their, I, I like to talk about the, the road we pave on the way to hell right? <laughs> we have good intentions, um, but our good intentions put gold bricks in this paved path to a terrible place. And the environmental movement is one of those movements that um, has done a lot of damage in the midst of doing good. And that has left us in a place where when the environmental movement speaks, we are speaking um, in representing one piece of the population in the United States, and that is upper middle class, middle class, well-educated white people. We have not brought alongside of us people of color. We have not made a place for them in the movement. Dr. Dorsetta Taylor at the University of Michigan um, did a study recognizing that um, the, the data on leadership in the environmental movement, leadership representing people of color, representing we, women is, is terrible. It's terrible, it's embarrassing. So in 2012, WEMIAC started our IDEAL initiative. It stands for Inclusion and Development of Environmental Allies and Leaders. You can check it out. I, again, I have this piece um, available for you. And we have over the last two years been doing deep listening work and working through an intentional process to begin to engage with people, all people in our communities, and to face our programs in that direction. So 
Um, so that was the impetus of bringing in uh, Nikki Silvestri for Women in Environment. This is the reason why we are substantially growing our watershed education program because in, in targeting school districts that are that um, disproportionately serve um, uh, people of color and minorities in our community, and um, and and this is probably the most important aspect of climate change from my view as a, as a social scientist and a, a, a leader in policy. Um, making sure that it's just not people who look like me who are empowered to speak the, their concerns. Asthma rates in, um, across the country have, have, over the last 10 years, they've increased by 50% and they disproportionately impact African-American children. And so if our governments, if our policymakers, if our medical community is not hearing solutions, self-identified solutions from the African-American community who is disproportionately impacted by this, then we're not gonna get it right. We're not gonna solve those problems. Um, if we are not understanding how to protect our lands through the lens of native people, who did that work for hundreds and thousands of years, if they are not defining for us how to take care of our national parks and our public spaces, how to take care of the Grand River and the Great Lakes, then we have an issue in front of us. So these people have to be um, brought back into conversation and um, listened to and acknowledged. And those, those are the voices that should be leading climate resiliency in our communities. So what is next? Um, that's a, a great question as well. Um, clean energy. In Michigan, we have distracted ourselves um, on the clean energy conversation with these big turbines. I love them. I think they're so beautiful. I love the aesthetics of turbines, but a lot of people don't. And so um, over the last 10 years, we've focused our debate on clean energy around wind. Um, are we gonna have wind offshore on Lake Michigan? Are we not? Are we gonna have wind in agricultural communities? Are we not? Um, but we've forgotten that solar is, <laughs> is another option. And um, in the meantime, solar has become incredibly affordable to deploy. So I have um, one of my favorite establishments, the Pyramid Scheme here. They recently installed solar panels. And um, Tammy Vandenberg and Jeff Vandenberg are two of my heroes for living their truth every day. Um, uh, this is an example of what needs to happen all across Grand Rapids. Every building should have panels on top. Um, yes, we need to have wind. Uh, we need to have utility scale wind to power our lives. But, um, but you know, we're used to these huge monolith energy systems, and what we need to build are energy systems in place, what we call decentralized energy systems, where pockets of energy are developed right where they're used. We lose 50% of the energy that we create, moving it from, in our case, the lakeshore here to Grand Rapids. So if we can create energy in place, we are able to deploy it in place, we're able to reduce our, our consumption right there. Um, community planning and investment is critical. So. Um, We've been starving our communities in Michigan and in other states across the country. Uh, we have been having this big debate about small government versus big government, this polarizing, toxic set of discussions that, um, that have distracted us from, um, from what really needs to happen. We have to rebuild our streets to capture stormwater in place and to provide more transportation options for people that aren't dependent on automobiles. We need to um, invest in these decentralized energy systems. We need to invest in uh, uh, rewilding our urban communities. I'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. 
bringing nature into our urban communities so that we can be more resilient. And, um, and we need to think hard about developing walkable, livable urban spaces so that we can stop the trend of sprawl. Because sprawl is, um, is impacting our economy, our environment, and our society in, um, in incredible ways. And uh, the food movement is important. The last picture here is uh, one of my favorite places, the Fulton Street Farmers Market, elbow to elbow in a people, food loving people traffic jam on a Saturday morning. <laughs> um, uh, food is an, another enormous um, opportunity for each of us as individuals. Um, the production and consumption of meat and um, moving food from one part of the country to another, to the market, or moving food from Chile to Michigan to market, is, um, represents about 50% of our global climate impact. Food alone. So um, living locally, using local foods as much as possible, supporting local farmers, and really being thoughtful about your consumption of meat is a critical step forward. There are lots and lots and lots of um, really great infographics and information about the food web and the production of meat and its impact on climate. And that conversation is rapidly growing. So I, I encourage you to really think hard about your food choices um, and rethink them and then rethink them again. <laughs> and behavior change is tough, right? Um, how many of you have changed a behavior recently? <laughs> Couple? Um, anybody willing to share their struggle with behavior change? Cody? I cut out meat about three months ago after washing some stuff, but uh, uh -huh. it's been tough, but it's, you know, I'm living the life that I want to live, and it's been growing up on a farm, so uh -huh. dealing with people kind of Yeah. In the back of the room, I saw somebody. Was yeah. it you? You cut out me about a year and four months ago, and it's actually been quite easy and enjoyable. Good. I found a lot of really good alternatives and loves for beans and nuts and eggs for our protein sources and soy products. Word. Great. Awesome. Congratulations. I, <coughs> about three years ago, started eating meat again after being a vegetarian <laughs> for eight years. And um, because I actually started to be unhealthy because I had a hard time finding alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I realize is that my consumption needs to be also mindful. So, trying to eat mostly organic, you know, and local farms and stuff like that is been difficult, but trying to do it as much as I can. Thank so, you. So yeah, just bring consumption down as opposed to cutting out. Great. Yeah. It's word. Awesome. <laughs> you got some fists in the air behind you. I don't know if you see them. <laughs> That's great. Who's biking more? I um, got a few folks. Um, and and who is uh, thinking more consciously of, about local food? Going to the farmer's market more. Yeah, good. And you're going to restaurants as well that support local farmers. Great. And what are you, what are you discovering? Feel you feel better? The food is way better. <laughs> way better. Anything else? There's more and more options. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you feel more deeply connected? Yeah, I see some heads shaking. So you feel better, you're more deeply connected to community. Any other benefits? Are you seeing, um, I, always, I always think that behavior change is a domino, a series of dominoes, right? Um, you start using, uh, canvas bags 
at the grocery and then all of a sudden it becomes easier to make better food choices and you become more thoughtful about consumption in general, right? So, um, so it, 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 as you coach your friends and your family, as you talk to them, um, I, I, I have learned best not to overwhelm. Find people where they are and coach them into that space. Be supportive, be positive about it, and they'll find their journey into all of the other pieces and parts of living a climate resilient lifestyle. Um, I, th I think that's incredibly important. So um, where do we need you? Right now we are working on a fracking moratorium in the city of Grand Rapids. Again, cards and things over the table. You can grab this one with the, uh, the pedestrian bridge um, uh, to learn more about that. We need to mobilize the city commissioner on this. We're not just working in the city, we're also working in Ada, Virgens, Cannon, Cascade, and myriad of townships um, with the goal of moving through all of the townships and municip municipalities throughout the watershed. But here in Grand Rapids, this, the moment is now um, to contact your city commissioner or the mayor and support them in this decision. And um, in the middle of March, we'll start to see the question move to the city's agenda. So March 17th, there will be a public hearing. March 24th, I think, is uh, a vote at city commission on a fracking moratorium for the city of Grand Rapids. Grand River restoration. How many of you have gone to some of the downtown design input meetings? A couple of folks. Um, the, the restoration of the Grand River is critical from a climate perspective because of two things. One, managing flooding. We have opportunities through the design of the, the Grand River as it goes through downtown to better manage flooding and therefore to be more resilient to the onslaught of more intense and more frequent rain events that we will continue to see into the future as a result of climate change. Um, second, this is an amazing opportunity to integrate wildlife corridors and native plants and to do this, what I'm starting to call rewilding of um, bringing nature back into the city. And we need leadership from the design community in that space. Uh, because the criticism of rewilding of native plants is always aesthetics. But what's more beautiful than nature and its intricate web of ecosystems, right? So bring us that voice. Let's talk about that. Think about as we design this space and as you have opportunities to provide input um, to the redesign of downtown and the river corridor, think about the places where we can let nature do its work. They are, goal number two is restoring the Grand River as the draw to downtown. What is more compelling than being at the 6th Street Bridge and seeing a heron roll, roll up with its, its gorgeous, gracious wings um, up the Grand River? It's really, those are the stunning moments, right? Let's bring nature back. Um, protecting our dunes and the lake shore. How many of you live in Grand Rapids so that you can go to the lake? That would be me. I moved all the way from Detroit so that I could go to Lake Michigan and not have a combined sewer overflow issue <laughs> impact, impact my experience. Having grown up in Detroit, um, it's hard to enjoy a day on the lake there. And um, our dunes, this is a globally unique ecosystem. You cannot find a freshwater dune system like ours anywhere in the world, anywhere. World-class beaches, amazing experiences. But developers are threatening those spaces every day of every month of every year. And so we really have to work hard on dune protections and on balanced development along the lakeshore. Discover climate solutions. Look at sustainable and resilient practices at home, in the community, in your work. Integrate them into your work for clients. Begin to help clients to see how they can take these steps, how they can message around these issues. I want you to be cautious about you know, the green screen and not being authentic in this place because that is dangerous. But you in the design community have these really amazing ways 
to articulate what is new and what is next and to help companies understand their role in delivering products um, to communities that are sustainable and resilient. Um, so I, I think that you have a lot of power in that space. If you want to get involved in climate policy, we have a citizens group working out of the WENIAC office, the Citizens Climate Lobby. They're networked with people across the country who are coming up with really amazing solutions to move both Republicans and Democrats forward in the legislatures and uh, to make sure that the United States is achieving, um, achieving solutions. So, if you're interested in that, I have a sign-up sheet on this table, and I would encourage you to just write in the notes, Climate Lobby, and I'll get you connected to, um, to Jim, who is leading up the Climate Lobby work. And um, we talked a little bit about what you're doing and what you're, what you're going to do. We have a community through our, our green drinks events that meets every month. Um, nobody will proselytize, but they will maybe buy you a beer. <laughs> and so Green Drinks is a really great place to access networks of people who are working on sustainability and resiliency, and I encourage you to enjoy that. We also have an event coming up um, to support our water ed watershed education programs, the Blue Tie Ball in April. I hope you can join us for that. Um, I want to answer a couple questions I didn't get to, um, the polar vortex and how to quickly respond to people who are throwing snowballs in Congress, like <laughs> Mr. Imhoff, one of my favorite peeps. Um, <laughs> so all you have to do is um, look at the airstream in the United States right now. So go to your weather page and capture a picture of the Airstream, and you see that the Airstream um, right now is, um, the cold air is moving uh, across the, the upper western states, uh, Washington, Idaho, and then it dips way, way, way down um, into Texas and into the southern states in this really dramatic arc and if you are to you know, Google a weather map, an Airstream map from, uh, I don't know, 1990, and you'll find the healthy Airstream, right, which kind of cuts across the middle of the U.S. in a little bit of an arc, but it's not as dramatic as, as the arc that we see, we're seeing right now during these winter months. And um, the airstream is created by currents and wind and warm air forcing cold air into different places, right? And so the airstream map is this really poignant example of um, how our airstreams are dramatically changing. And then I also like to talk about the evaporation of the lakes as well. So. Um, although that argument is starting to fail because the lakes are freezing over again as a result of the polar, polar vortex, but until recently, um, between the, the 1970s and, uh, and let's say 2011, um, the lakes were not freezing over at all. Um, I happen to know, uh, because my grandfather raced uh, bikes on the ice in, in Detroit way back in the day, that the lakes would freeze over all the time in the old days. And, um, and so the whole idea that we have more snow and so there is no climate is actually counterintuitive. The reason why we have more snow is because the lakes are warmer, more water is evaporating into the air and then falling on our communities, particularly in the, the western snow belt in Michigan. So, um, so, you know, more snow is climate, more snow is precipitation, more pre precipitation, more intense and more dramatic um, precipitation events. Does that make sense? A couple of good tools for you there? Good. Um, technology. I recently posted the amazing work that Portland is doing. They're changing up all of their water pipes with so these pipes that are generating energy. Holy shit. <laughs> 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 that 
it is yeah. so cool. Um, technology is constantly evolving, and it's through technology that we're going to be able to, to leapfrog these problems. And so, again, in the creative space, in the design space, in the tech space where all of you sit, there is this powerful, powerful moment to identify new technologies and to readily accept them. We live in this culture that distrusts new technology. Let's get over that. We gotta, we've got to try some stuff. This is a moment when, um, you know, just, just like our society, uh, you know, rose to the moment when we had to defend ourselves from uh, the axis of evil in the 1940s. <laughs> this is a moment when we should be mobilized um, to use our fear and our concern for our planet and our lives and move our communities um, forward together rapidly, s synchronicitously, um, to address the, the biggest thing that is impacting us right now, which is climate. This is the social issue of the next, um, the next 50 years. And, um, and is it too late? No, it's not. We've, we've got time, but we, we can't be complacent anymore. And we have to deal with our fear. And that is a place where um, calling all of you to be emotionally intelligent <laughs> and self-aware and to acknowledge those places where you're fearful about change in your world and in your life. And instead of um, drowning them in Taco Bell and <laughs> uh, visits to the mall and mass consumption and at all of the things that we do to, um, uh, it, to distract ourselves from our reality, face those fears and and discover your own solutions, the solutions that work for you, that work for your family, and that work for your community, and spread those solutions forward. I think my time's about up. Any questions, concerns, comments? Um, what is your view of nuclear energy? Can it be a valuable tool, or are the risks too great? Um, I believe that clean energy is the solution, and I don't believe that fossil fuel consumption is a bridge to anywhere except our, um, our, uh, the decline of our societies. That includes um, nuclear as well as gas and, you know, you name it, whatever, whatever new fossil fuel <laughs> um, technology that is emerging. In particular, in the Great Lakes, I think we have a crisis in front of us. We have 50-year-old nuclear plants that are, are very poorly regulated. Just like the oil industry regulates itself, essentially, the nuclear industry regulates itself. And there's this constant movement between the companies like Entergy that create nuclear power and, um, and the regulatory space of people and talent and minds, right? And um, uh, we are very concerned about the nuclear plants that are adjacent to the Great Lakes, that use the Great Lakes for cooling, um, particularly those that are older, like Palisades, which is in the South Haven area. And, um, and we are even more concerned about the movement of um, radioactive waste across the Great Lakes for storage and the fact that all of the, the nuclear waste in uh, the Great Lakes Basin is stored in adjacency to the Great Lakes themselves. So um, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> what? I mean, it's just common sense. Why would you place nuclear waste within proximity to the world's largest source of fresh water? That's, that's dumb. <laughs> Yeah. Fifty years ago, 
we built an enormous amount of water infrastructure and, um, and it's under the ground and we don't see it and therefore we don't think about it. So just like trash goes to a landfill and we forget that it's a problem, water rolls through our systems that are declining, that um, need a significant amount of investment and um, we've forgotten about it. So now we're in trouble because all of that infrastructure is declining at a rate that our municipalities who are strapped for cash can no longer continue to invest. And the infrastructure is just becoming more and more and more expensive. So um, yeah, water is a right, it's a human right. The, the water of Michigan is um, in the Great Lakes is partially protected um, our surface waters are in the public trust and what that means is any water that you can um, ride in on a boat if you can get on a boat <laughs> and be in water that water is protected as part of the public trust and all of us have the right to defend it um, although that's arguable because of some case law but I, I'm not going to dive deep into that um, our groundwater is not protected it is not in the public trust and that was um, a loophole created by the Granholm administration in 2008 when we were working on the public trust for the Great Lakes with all of the eight Great, eight Great Lakes states and, the, uh, and Canada. Um, some states in the Great Lakes Basin have protected their groundwater, not all. And um, in particular when we are seeing um, Okay, so then we look at the national picture <laughs> and the global picture on water. And um, we know that farmers in California, which is the breadbasket of the United States, the cornucopia, um, where most of our food is produced, uh, they are struggling to produce food because they don't have access to water and they're in a historic drought and that drought is likely linked to climate. And, woo. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> great, Sorry. can you hear me well enough just with my, yeah. my big girl voice? Um, <laughs> so all of, all of this agricultural production is moving where over the next 20 years? Where do you think agricultural production is going to move? Overseas. Overseas and where else? right here. Um, so the potato growers who grow potatoes for all of our french fries at all of our fast food spots just bought 13,000 acres of land in the Upper Peninsula and their agricultural withdrawals from groundwater resources exceed a frac. So a frac is 20 billion gallons of water and these guys are pulling that much water out every day. A portion of it goes back into the system as it drains back into the, the groundwater aquifers, but a large portion of that water is being shipped out in all of those potatoes. And we're going to see more and more and more of those large-scale land purpose, purchases for large-scale agriculture, big ag, in, um, in Michigan. We're already, agriculture is already the number two driver of our economy in the state of Michigan. So we're poised, we have the infrastructure, we have the land resources, and more, most importantly, we have the water. So we really have to get on top of this groundwater issue now. And further, water is going to be the thing that brings all of my best friends back to Michigan. Um, <laughs> they are in LA, um, they are in San Francisco, they are in uh, Bend and Portland and uh, in Washington State and I have just been telling them buy a house now and I got this nice little neighborhood for you <laughs> because um, soon enough they will no longer to be able to afford a water rich lifestyle and um, and companies and people will start to return to the Great Lakes. And so we have to be prepared for massive population growth in the Great Lakes as well over the, the arc of the next 20 to 40 to 50 years. That's a great question. Thank you, Maria. So I have one more question and then one okay. more and then we're going to wrap up. Great. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm sorry I don't have any data. There was a recent study in, I think, Arizona looking at methane emissions and their impact on the um, ozone layer, and, um, and it's not good, and it, it is a serious question. Um, our legislature is, uh, is uh, <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> um, our legislature is methane hungry, so they want to pull methane out of our landfills. They want to um, they want to frack, they um, which is a methane heavy fossil fuel extraction, and so th that is absolutely something that we need to be looking at. Thank you. I'll start asking the question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions, your dialogue. Um, Lots of ways over here to get connected to our work, and we have a wonderful website. Thanks to our communications director, a creative in-house at WEMIAC, Josh Leffingwell. You can go to WEMIAC.org and find out more. Stay connected. We're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, I think we do Instagram, too. And, um, and we'd love to see you at our events and um, at our meetings. Please find ways to get involved. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.